Uh, my name is Greg Adkins. My whole life, uh, things that have been important to me have been my family and friends. And I've gone to Access Now for six years. And so I've grown so much the last six years, uh, both spiritually as well as, um, as well, I guess you can say romantically. I've, I've met my wife here at Access. And so to say that Access is a life changer is, is definitely an understatement. My whole life, uh, family and friends have been, you know, two of the most important things that I've had in my life. And every week at Access, we get these connection cards, and it's exciting because it allows us to share our heart and have others pray for our prayers. And so every every week, I've always written down, I pray for my family, my friends, and their salvation. And it's just really cool to see that the prayers that I've prayed and that others have prayed at Access have now come to be answered and it's really exciting to see both friends and family now uh, attending Access and you can see them growing in their relationship with Jesus. It's been pretty easy for us to invite others to Access and I think the main reason is is that uh, is really focus on the, the relationships and it's not that you know you have to focus on these crazy rules that if you as soon as you break them you're you're doomed forever um, what's really important to access and what makes it really you know easy for us to invite others is the focus on relationships obviously the relationship with Jesus and that we want to constantly grow but also the relationship that we share with the people that go to access the thing I love about Access is that it's been an answer to my prayers. It's a place now where I can invite my family and friends to watch them grow uh, in the relationship with Jesus. My name is Greg Adkins and I am Access. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Access. I love stories like that. I really do. I love stories like Greg's of people who just kind of made a decision early on that I'm going to care about the things God cares about. And what God seems to care about is people, people who he loves, people who are lost and separated from him. God cares about those things. And I've known Greg for a while. It was cool because I, I knew Greg and Rachel individually. And then I knew them when they started dating. And then I got to perform their wedding. So like access has been a huge part of their life. And now to see it come full circle and to see them inviting family and friends and to see the life change that's happened in them is just really why we do what we do. So I'm excited about that. Well, if this is your first time here, we're honored you're here. My name is Jason, I'm one of the pastors here, and you're coming in at a perfect time, honestly. We are in a series called I Am Access, and if you're kind of kicking the tires of our church or even kicking the tires of faith, and you have questions about any of it, this is the perfect series for you to be here because we're going to talk about our church, and we're going to talk about why we exist and why, really, why does it even matter? You know, you passed by a lot of churches this morning on the way to come here, so why did you come here? And if we're going to do something that matters, we've got to kind of do it together. So we've been talking about that. And last week we kicked off the series, and if you missed it, let me recap where we've been. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, there is this verse. Now Philippians chapter 2 is this beautiful story. Paul is writing from prison to this church in Philippi, and he writes and he says this. He says that we want you to become imitators of Jesus, it means to become like Jesus. And then after that he says, now when you do this, you're going to have to change some things about you. So change without grumbling, change without complaining. And then in chapter 2, verse 15, there is this verse right in the middle of it that is just beautiful. I love the illustration that it uses. It says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, like, if you do all these things, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. And last week we stopped there. We said you will shine among them like stars in the sky. And all of us understand that we live in a world that is increasingly dark that every morning we wake up, there is another story in the news of something that's happened, and it just makes the world feel just a little dimmer and a little darker. And what Paul says is if you'll live like Jesus in that world, no matter how dark it gets, you will have the potential to shine. Like there will be something about you that is beautiful and transcendent, that there will be something about you that is alluring to other people. And I love this illustration because it says you will shine like them 
among, among them like stars in the sky. And I thought one star can be beautiful, but how amazing would it be if a church full of people like this collected together and brought all of our energy, all of our thoughts, all of our heart, all of our resources together and said, Jesus, just make us like you. What would happen is this church would be so full that in the midst of a city that is full of darkness, in the middle of a world that is increasingly getting dark, we would shine among them like stars in the sky. Well, last week I read this verse, and then I kind of went back in and dug a little more, and I like how it goes into the next verse. It says this, you will shine among them like stars in the sky, and then the next verse, verse 16 says, as you hold firmly to the word of life. Now, I love this because I kind of dug into it a little bit, and on the surface, this verse makes sense. It says, you, you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life, which means as you hold firmly to becoming like Jesus asks us to become. That's what that means. But the Greek word here for the phrase, hold firmly, is an interesting word. Now, what you got to know is this. Greek and Hebrew are the two languages the Bible was originally written in. And translators, over the course of time, have taken those ancient words from Greek and Hebrew, and they've done their best job to translate them into English. The problem is, some of the words are nimble. They have different kind of meanings. And so what scholars did was they applied their best estimation to each word. Now, the Greek word for the word, hold firmly, is the word epecho which means this, it means to hold on to, but it also means to hold outstretched. Okay, get this. It means to hold firmly on to, but it can also mean to hold outstretched. And what I think Paul means is this. He says, you're going to shine among them like stars in the sky. You, you will be irresistible to other people. They will be drawn to you when you hold firmly to the teachings of Jesus. That's, that's where you find life. But you will also, and possibly more importantly, shine among them like stars in the sky when you hold outstretched, when you hold out to others the message of hope. When you share your faith with others, when you tell others about the hope that they can find in Jesus, when you tell people that they don't have to stay the same, that their life that at one time was so broken can somehow be magically put back together by their heavenly Father, when you explain that message of hope to other people, when you hold on to it with hands outstretched, you will shine among them like stars in the sky. And I was thinking about that verse this whole week. I love the imagery that we can shine, that we can be different, that we can make a difference. And last week we talked about you. We said, what would it look like if you began to do what Jesus asked us to do, which is just to open your eyes, to open your eyes to see the world around us that so desperately needs us. It means you're going to see your relationship with others differently. It means you're going to see how you treat your stuff differently. It means you're going to see how you even view your relationship with God differently. So we talked about what would it look like if we all opened our eyes. This morning, I want to take it and move it from being a personal thing to something that we do together. I want to ask you, what would it look like for us, all of us, not just to open our eyes, but to not just care about, but to actually do the things that Jesus asked us to do? Now, to do this, I want to kind of um, ask you a question What do you think about when you think about church? Not our church, just church. What imagery, what picture comes to your mind when you think about church and what a church should do and what a church should be? About a year and a half ago, my wife and I went to a movie together, and we went on a date, and um, I love taking my wife out. We try to go out on a date several times a month, and sometimes we go out on dates, and we'll do fun things like mini golf, or we'll just paint pottery, but, but this time we were going to a movie. Now, sometimes my wife is awesome, and she'll say, whatever you want to watch, and we'll pick some, like, action movie, something with some blood in it, you know what I'm saying? But on this particular date, it was like, if there is blood, like if over here is Rambo, we didn't go like romantic comedy, we went super mega chick flick, like we went to a girl date. And so we had dinner at a place that was a girl dinner place, and then we went to a movie that I would not recommend to any dude in the auditorium. It was a movie about Jane Austen. Now, what you need to know about me is I don't know nothing about Jane Austen, nothing, nothing. I know Pride and Prejudice, and that's it. I don't even know what it's about. And, and so we go, and it's totally for Liz. Like, it's just me and her, but I'm taking her out for her. But I had this fear. As we were going to the movie, I'm like, I am totally going to run into one of my friends. And he's going to ask me what we're seeing, and I'm going to have to tell him, Jane Austen. And, and this is going to be this awful moment. And what's weird for me is I run into people all the time in Lakeland and in Brandon who attend our church, and I love that. And I also hate it. (laughs) I I love it because I love seeing you. And and I I hate it because there are times when I meet people that I don't really know that have attended our church for a little while that maybe have heard some of my stories. And so they kind of know me, but I don't know them. And I had this fear. I was going to be at this movie and I was going to run into one of you guys at the movie. And so we go and truthfully, I'm going for 
all the wrong reasons. Like, I guess the right reason is I'm going because I love my wife, but I could care less, honestly. Like, I was going to punch my husband card, to let the world know that this was why I'm a good husband, this is what I'm doing. Let me tell you what I didn't do. I didn't check in on Facebook to let all my friends know. Nobody needed to know that, you know what I'm saying? When I was going, the thing that had me most excited was not the movie, it was the popcorn. Can I get a good amen, anybody? A little movie theater butter on that. Ooh, you'd slap your mom for some more. And um, love it. And then, and then we went in and we, we walked in and it was awesome because I was nervous about this movie to begin with. But we get into this big auditorium and there is nobody in the auditorium. And we go and we sit down and it's awesome because it's just me and her and we sit down together and nobody comes in and the movie starts and I thought to myself, God, you have spared me from any kind of ridicule. Thank you. You are amazing. Thank you for this. And the movie starts and the movie gets going and I'm eating my popcorn and I thought to myself, I hope this is at least quasi-entertaining. Like, I hope that on some level that it surprises me that maybe something will be happy or funny, maybe something I'll laugh about afterwards. But the movie starts and it is just dreadful for me. Like, nails on a chalkboard. And then, to make matters worse, at one point halfway through, my wife had to use the restroom and so she got up and left. And I am sitting (laughs) in this room by myself and I promise you, I had this immediate fear grip my heart like someone, one of you jokers is gonna walk in and see me and this picture is gonna be all over the internet like I am ruined in this moment. Well then, then the movie happens, right? And we watch it and we get in our car and leave and let's go, so how bad was it? That was her question, how bad was it? And I was like, all right, okay, um, hmm. It was terrible, okay, I tried. I was gonna be like, it was sweet, it was romantic. It, it drove me absolutely crazy. So on the whole way home, we picked the movie apart. Let me ask you a question. I want you to be really honest with yourself. For how many of you is this an exaggerated version of your experience with church? For how many of us is this our exaggerated version of church? We go because we just want to keep God happy and keep him at arm's length. We want to check our God box. We go to church and we like it for certain reasons. We like the music or we're engaged by the preaching or we like the program that the church has for our kids. So we go for that reason. That's the popcorn. And we sit and we watch. We don't really engage with anything. We watch. Then after we leave, we get in the car and we don't ask, okay, how can I apply this to myself? We ask, was that fun? I didn't like this. I didn't like the way he said that. Why did he make that joke? That was inappropriate. We do these things and we pick apart what's happened in a church service and we've missed the whole point altogether. We've missed it. Now, I'm guilty of this. Like, I'm not blaming you. I've done this many times in my life. But I think when we do this, we rob church of its potential to be an agent of massive change in the world. Now, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to go to the Bible. Now, normally in a message, I, I try to intertwine lots of personal stories in with the Bible. Today, I'm going to do something that I do about once a year. I'm going to preach a message that I've preached before. And the reason I'm preaching this again, I've had people say, why did you do that one again? Well, until we're all living it out, like, I'm going to keep doing this. Like, over and over, every year, you're going to hear a message like this because it is so important. I'm going to ask you to do something. As we read these words today, I'm going to ask you not just to let these words be words that slip through your ear and out the other, but may these be words that somehow get a hold of your heart. And I want you to try to reimagine your view of church. Try to reimagine what could happen if we would all fully engage with each other. If you have your Bibles this morning, Acts chapter 1, we're going to read in just a moment. Before we get to Acts chapter 1, here's what's happening. Jesus has come and he's lived this amazing life. He's healed the sick, he's raised the dead, and beyond all that, now he has died on the cross for the sake of humanity. He's risen from the dead, which proves every promise that he made is true, and he's living with his disciples who must at this time feel powerful. They must feel like if Jesus could conquer the death, hell, and the grave. If Jesus can do these things, then there's nothing that could ever stop us. And so they're with Jesus, and then Jesus says this. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he gets his guys together, and here's what he says. He says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. So Jesus is at the restaurant, and the chips and salsa are there, and after they're kind of done with the appetizers, but before the fajitas come out, Jesus says this, because I got something you need to know. He says this, He says, do not leave Jerusalem. That's where they were. Don't leave the city, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. Jesus is saying this, I don't want you to leave Jerusalem. Some stuff's about to happen. Do not leave the city, but wait for the gift my father has promised. I love that the two words that are used to describe the Holy Spirit here are gift and promise, because that's what the Holy Spirit is. He is a gift from God and the fulfillment of so many promises. He says, wait here in the city. 
He says, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? At that time, Israel was oppressed by the Roman government. And they're like, Jesus, like death can't hold you down. If death can't hold you down, we're going to overthrow the government, right? And then look how Jesus responds. He says to them, it is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Verse 8, one of the most important verses in all the Bible. But you will receive power. This is the promise from Jesus. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And, this is so important, this is one sentence with a semicolon in the middle. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the result of that is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now leave this verse up here for me. What Jesus says to his guys is this. In a moment, I'm going to leave, and I'm leaving you here. But I'm not leaving you alone. I'm sending someone to help you. I am sending the person of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you are filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit, the result will be that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What you need to know is this. Jerusalem was their city. Judea was their country. Samaria was a part of their country, but it was a very ostracized part of their country. And then to the ends of the earth. So what Jesus says is, When the Holy Spirit has come inside of you, when he's come alive in you, the result will be that you will take this and you will spread it. That you will gather together in my name, you will come together, but after that you will spread the message to other people. So what Jesus says is, you'll take it to your city, to your country. Then I love the next part, Samaria, which is just like the most outcast of outcasts. And so think about who that might be in our society. Drug addicts, homeless, prostitutes. But just imagine what you consider the worst of the worst. And he says to them, like, you're also invited in. You're going to spread the message there. And then you're going to take it, and as a result, it's going to spread to the ends of the earth. And then we won't read this now, but the next two or three verses says this. And after he said these things, he said, stay here. You're going to receive the gift my father has promised. After he said those things, the next verse says that he went up to heaven to be with his father. And the disciples stood there. And I've always tried to imagine this. They're just standing there and watch Jesus go. And they're like, huh. That was it, huh? The rose from the dead thing, that was cool, but now we're alone. Huh. They just watched him go. And then the next verse says something awesome. Then these angels appear from God and they say, why are you standing here? That's the question I'm going to ask you all morning today. Why are you still standing here? Didn't you hear what Jesus said? Go to this place. There you'll receive the gift that the Father has promised. In Acts chapter 2, we read that they go to this place that Jesus promised them. Now, what you need to know is this. We're going to do some math today to see the result. The the whole thing starts with Jesus, who is one, and his 12 disciples. So the movement that Jesus is spreading equals about 13 different people. 12 plus 1 equals 13. Now, it's going to get a lot harder from here. Just try to keep up with me, okay? There's 13 people. This is the whole movement of Jesus at this point, 13 people. And Jesus says, now take this message and spread it. And as a result of spreading it, watch what happens with the Holy Spirit. So Acts chapter 2, here's what happens. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Acts 2, verse 1. They all go to this place, and it says this. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So they gathered together. They're all together in one place. But then suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house and they, where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came upon each to rest on them. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So now the book of Acts uses these two different illustrations to talk about the Holy Spirit being there in that room. Wind and fire. Now in Genesis chapter 1, all the way back at the beginning, we meet the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, in the beginning, God spoke and he created the heavens and the earth. And it says, the earth was formless and void. And then a couple of verses down, it says, and the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. It hovered over the waters. Now, the Hebrew word for spirit there is ruach, which is fun to say, especially if you've got some phlegm kind of chilling back here. Ruach, that's what it is. It's this this wind. There's this wind, this analogy of wind with the Holy Spirit. And then we hear in the book of Acts, and Acts was written in the New Testament, which was written in Greek, and the word for Holy Spirit and fire here is the word pneuma. Pneuma. So we meet the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is characterized by two different analogies, wind and fire. Wind and fire. Now, what happens when you mix wind and fire? Fire spreads. Fire gets bigger. 
It, it becomes uncontrollable. Fire moves. It breathes. If you've ever watched the news and seen when there's brush fires in California or in Colorado, they'll do everything they can. They'll fly helicopters and planes with thousands of gallons of water and dump it trying to put it out or trying to at least contain the fire. But what they always freak out about is not when there's fire because they're trying to contain that. They freak out when there's wind because what the wind does is it takes the fire and it increases it exponentially. So what Jesus knew was this. He said, guys, I want you to go to this room and I want you to gather together and there you will receive this gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, wind and fire. Something is going to change. So now this whole movement starts with Jesus, who is one person. And he invites his 12 disciples in. Just follow the math. 1 plus 12 is 13. And then it says in this room there was 120 people. Now, just keep doing the math with me. That's 133, okay, right? Get your calculators out, right? 133 people in this movement is happening now. 133. But Jesus has just sent the Holy Spirit. Wind and fire have taken over, and something comes alive inside of them, and they do something unbelievable. If you skip down a few verses in chapter 2, we meet Peter. Now, Peter is this incredible enigma of a person. When we first meet Peter, Peter, he's, um, not Peter from the Hunger Games. <laughs> P- Peter, Peter. When we first meet him, I hate Peter. My wife has a crush on that little dude. Um, when we first meet Peter, when we first meet him, he's this crazy enigma of a guy. Like, he's all jumpy and weird. Like, he's the kind of guy who's got a little too much blood in his caffeine system, if you know what I'm saying. Like, he's just, like, always wired. He's always like this. And we first meet him, and he's jumpy and weird, and he does some weird things. Like at one point, we read in the the Gospels that Jesus has just done this amazing miracle where he's fed 5,000 people. And after he was done, he sent the disciples away across this sea, and he goes away by himself to spend time with God, to pray. And after he's done, he's like, man, I sent the disciples away. I don't even have a boat. I'll just walk, right? And he's Jesus. And so he walks across the water to the people. Well, the verse says that the the wind was strong and that the seas were rough and Jesus comes walking across and Peter, this this jumpy guy, sees Jesus walking across the water and he says, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come out and walk with you. And Jesus says, it is I. And so Peter does something that I don't know that I would do and he steps out of the boat and puts one foot down. Then he has the courage, like putting one foot out of the boat is not brave. Anybody can do that. It's putting the next foot out. And so Peter puts his next foot out and stands on the water. Now, I've tried this at home. Um, It may work for you. It doesn't work for me. And it it worked for Peter. And Peter walks towards Jesus. He has this incredible moment with Jesus where he has the courage to trust him. Later, we see Jesus. um, He's dying on the cross. And, And all of his disciples, who at one time were strong, they were with him. They felt powerful because of him. Fear has gripped their hearts, and because fear has gripped their hearts, they don't know what to do, and Peter runs for his life, and at one point, this little girl comes up to him, and she's like, hey, I've seen you before. You're you're with Jesus, right? And Peter, who had the courage to step out of a boat and walk on water, doesn't have the courage to tell a small child that he was with Jesus for fear of his life. And so we meet Peter again, this guy who's this weird enigma of a person, and Peter was in the room. Peter was one of the 133 people. And so Peter is there in the room with Jesus, I mean, with with the disciples. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And check out what happens. Skip down a few verses in chapter 2. We're going to read verse 37. It says this. Let me back up say, Peter has just preached this amazing message. Like, he has the courage. He steps outside, and he preaches this message that is strong. Like, it's one of those ones where if I were to preach that here, we'd have a lot more open seats next week. He just preaches this very strong message. And then the people respond this way. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to their hearts, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied this, he said, repent and be baptized, each and every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for whom the, uh, for whom, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Verse 40. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Verse 41. Those who, were, who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, just kind of follow the math with me here. We had 133 people at one point, and now Peter, who received the power of the Holy Spirit, 
He steps out of his comfort zone and he preaches, and over 3,000 were added that day. Just do the math. We're at 3,133 people at this point. There is this movement. It is taking off and it is spreading. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Peter steps out of his comfort zone and he says this message that cuts the hearts of people, and watch what happens. As he shares his faith, as he shares his story, as he is a witness, like Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, 8, which only means telling what you've experienced, as he does these things, people respond, and it says that many of them are saved, check this out, and baptized. And if you're here, you need to understand something. Your relationship with Jesus was never intended to be a private relationship with Jesus. Never was. In fact, I would go as far to say this. Many churches, in my opinion, have robbed the people in their church. They've robbed Christians of a fulfilling, shine like the kind of shine like the stars kind of experience with God because they've taught them that their relationship with Jesus is all about them. So everything they do is about them. The problem is, like, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. I don't think you were created for a private relationship with Jesus. I do think that you can have a personal relationship with him, but the real mark of a personal relationship with Jesus is a public relationship with Jesus. And so Peter steps out. He has this public moment where he steps out and 3,000 people are saved. And then these 3,000 or more people get baptized. Let me call a timeout for a second and say this to you. If you are here and you've had a private relationship with Jesus where you just kind of hope that nobody really knows, like I'll even put it to you like this. If people at your work don't know that you're a Christian, if people at your work don't know that you attend a life-giving church, if people at your, in your relationships and in your spheres of influence don't know this, I would question whether or not you've really been saved. That's heavy. That's strong. I know that a person can pray to receive Christ and sit on the sidelines, but you are missing out on the joy of a public relationship with Jesus. Let me just say this as well. If you're here and you've made a decision to serve Jesus, you've surrendered your life to him, but it's kind of been a private thing and you've never been baptized, baptized, baptism is the first sign of going public. We're having baptism on the first Sunday in February and I implore you, please get baptized. Please go public with your faith and watch what happens to your life as a result of it. It's unbelievable. So Peter, this guy who's this weird enigma of a person, he preaches and 3,000 people are saved. And I love the last verse that we just read. It says this, it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Okay, so check this out. The result of a church where people who are fired up, who are filled with God's Holy Spirit, that are not living private Christian lives, that are not even living personal Christian lives, but are living public Christian lives, the result is is that the Lord's going to add to the number daily. Now, why does that matter? It matters because heaven and hell are realities, And people are going to spend eternity in one or the other. And if that is true, and if we are the tool that God uses, like, I believe that the local church is the hope of the world, and if the local church is the hope of the world and there is no plan B, then we need to be really, really good at it. We we do. Like, you, you need to be good at it, and I need to be good at it. And so the Bible says that people are just confessing Jesus as Lord, and they're going public with their faith by getting baptized. And all these things are happening, and then look at the results of it. So what happens is, they start by gathering. Follow me, okay? They gather, and then they don't just stay in the upper room. They could have just stayed in that room and been filled with the Holy Spirit and had more prayer services and just kept the 120 happy and saved and speaking in tongues. And all. They could have done all that stuff, but then they leave. Because if they stay there, the message stays there. Then they, they scatter, they leave, and as a result of Peter stepping out and leaving, 3,000 people are added to the number that day. But then watch what happens. They gather together. They empower each other. They, they, they receive empowerment from the Holy Spirit. And then they scatter. Now watch what happens next. Acts chapter 2. This is the story of the first church. It says this. It says, Then they, these followers of Jesus, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. Verse 44. All the believers who were together, that means gathered there together, and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And check out this line. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what I love about this is this. There is this cycle. There is this pattern of things that we can see that are happening. It starts with Jesus gathering his 12 disciples. And he says, okay, listen, don't stay here. I want you to go to this upper room and you'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit not to stay there, but to scatter. 
Now check this out. Here is the cycle. Here is this pattern that we can all live out. We are called to gather together. This is the point of church. Maybe you've asked yourself before, what is the purpose of church? And I need to say something to you about this. We need each other. Like, we need you, and you, you, I need you, you need me, we need each other. Like, this is a really big deal. And we've gotten really good at treating church like we treat the movies, which is I'm going for my entertainment, and as long as I'm entertained, I'll keep going back. The moment I'm not, I'm out of there. And when you do that, you rob yourself, and you rob someone else of a potential miracle. You just do. Like, we need each other. We need to be there for each other. What's scary to me is this. Statistically, we are moving away from this as a country. Statistically, 48% of people in America who identify themselves as church-going regular attenders attend church less than once every six weeks. 48%. Like, look around this room. Like, imagine how many people would be here if the people who called access their church on a Sunday all just decided to show up on the same Sunday. It is unbelievable what we would see if we would all do this together. So we gather together for lots of reasons. We gather together to encourage each other, to worship together, to encourage, to strengthen, to bless, to meet a need, to offer a hug, to be a hand of assistance. We honestly, we gather together to give. And I wish that I could tell you story after story of the ways that your giving makes a difference. Sometimes I can't because we give so much to people in our church to meet needs that they have. But I don't want to do that because I don't want to embarrass the people. But we need to do this together. We gather together. We're empowered by God's Holy Spirit. And the result is that we have to scatter. We have to move. We have to keep taking what we've learned, what we've grown, how we've been empowered. We have to keep scattering it. We have to keep moving it. And what happens is this. All these things happen. 3,000 are added to the number when Peter preaches. And then the next few verses is, and then they gather together in homes. So what happens is the church grows big. It adds more people. And as it continues to grow big, they continue to receive empowerment by the Holy Spirit. And they continue to scatter to reach more people. But then watch what happens. Then they gather again. It says here in verse 42, they gather together in homes, they praise God for what he's done, they worship together, they break bread, they fellowship together, and then the result is they go out and meet needs with what they've done. Now, what would it look like if you and I had a completely different revelation of the intention of what church is? I think if we could see church for the way Jesus intended it to be, we would understand that we're called to something big. We're called to gather together in Jesus' name, to come here. So church on Sunday mornings is so much bigger than just you getting a God fix. It is. We need to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit, but then not so that we can keep church for church people. A couple weeks ago, I had lunch with a good friend of mine, and great dude, I love him, I love his family so much, but he's been really jaded by church, like organized church, organized religion. And we had lunch together, and he said to me, Jason, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of done with church. I'm into home church now what does home church mean? You just sleep in on Sundays and like send your tithe to yourself? Like what does that mean? And, and he goes, well, we get together with families sometimes and, you know, we pray for each other and stuff. And I'm like, well, that's, that's a good thing, right? But when you do that, you undercut the real value and meaning of church altogether. He said, well, what do you actually mean by that? I said, in a good biblically functioning church, I think what happens is we come together, we gather together for a purpose. We're empowered by God's Holy Spirit and the result needs to be simply this. As a result of being empowered by God's Holy Spirit, now we take it and we scatter. We go to homes. We serve people. We serve those less fortunate than us. We meet needs. We go around the world. We build churches. We do all these things together because we've gathered, but not so that we could gather, but so that we could scatter. Now think about the church. What would have happened in the book of Acts if Jesus left his disciples and he said, go to this upper room in Jerusalem and there you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And the 12 of them go to this room instead of being 120, the 12 of them go, they get their faces melted off by this experience with the Holy Spirit. And then they're just like, let's just stay here and do that again. Let's do that some more. Do you you feel that? Let's do that again. What would happen? The message of Jesus, the message of hope would stop there. But because they gathered, were empowered, and scattered, the message spread. Now check this out. Just a few verses down, the church continues to grow. And as it grows, it gets bigger and it continues to get smaller. Acts chapter 4, we're going to read this. It says this. It says, um, actually, let's skip down to uh, chapter 4, right? Chapter 4, verse 4, it says this. But many who heard the message believed. So the church continues to grow. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Do the math on this with me. It says the number of men grew to 5,000. In those days, they didn't really count women and children. And so what we know is this. We had, we had over 3,000 at one point, at at least 5,000 more, 5,000 plus. It means we have at least 8,000. Chances are, statistically, we have over 20,000 people represented in that number, and it happened like that. Like overnight, wind and fire spread, and lives are being changed. This happens. It's unbelievable to see how quickly 
the first church grew. Now then something happened, okay? And here's where I want to talk for just a moment. By Acts chapter 6, Acts 7, 8, and 9, something's happened. The church has grown in Jerusalem so much. In fact, scholars say that there were about 200,000 people living in Jerusalem in this time. 200,000. Of that 200,000, 100,000, 50%, identified themselves as followers of Jesus. They had seen, experienced it. They were following him. So they met together in the temple courts, but that's too many people for one temple. So they begin to spread. They begin to scatter. But Jesus said this. He said, you will be my witnesses when you receive the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. That's their city. Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But there was this problem. There was 200,000 people in Jerusalem, 100,000 of them are believers, and they're all in Jerusalem. Like, they're not doing the Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And so Jesus, or God allows something to happen. Now, the Bible doesn't say this implicitly. This is my observation from having read the book of Acts dozens and dozens of times. All these Christians, all these Christ followers are all centered in Jerusalem now, but like nothing's happening. And so God allows something to happen. He allows a persecution to break out. Now, I could read several stories for you, but let me just tell you for the sake of time. In Acts chapter 7, we meet a man named Stephen. Stephen is known in church history as the first martyr, the first person who died for the cause of Jesus. And Stephen, at one point, is arrested and thrown into the streets, and he's about to be stoned by a mob. Now, I want you to think of this, okay? I don't know what imagery comes to mind when you think about a stoning of a person, but if you've ever watched the news and seen a clip of like a Middle Eastern riot, imagine hundreds of angry men with rocks that are not small, but I'm talking like a, a cinder block segment. Imagine this, and they would take a person and they would just slam them over and over and over. Oftentimes they would take it a step farther and they would take the person and they would actually like dig a hole in the ground and cover them up so that either their head only was exposed or just their upper torso was exposed so they couldn't even move. And it says that Stephen is stoned over and over again for not denying his faith in Jesus. He says, how can I deny something that I've, only, I've not only seen, but I've experienced? And there's this moment, I love this. It says that Stephen is being stoned and he looks up and he sees the heavens part. And there's this imagery. He says there, he sees God the Father. And it says this, and standing to his side is his son Jesus. Now, the Bible often throughout the Bible says things like, seated at the right hand of the Father is Jesus. But this is the only time in all of Scripture where it says that Jesus is standing. Why would Jesus be standing in this moment? I submit to you, it is to receive into his presence someone who lived a life worth standing for. And I've asked this question to myself many times, like what would it look like to be the kind of church that would cause Jesus to stand up? The kind of church that would cause Jesus to say, man, well done, you shine among them like stars. What would that look like? And I want to offer you one thought. It is to not get comfortable making church for us but it's to continue to live a life where we gather to be empowered so that we can scatter. Acts chapter 9, after Stephen is stoned, it says this, this is a great persecution broke out. Like the government came in and tried to like squelch what was happening with this movement. Like 100,000 people in the city of Jerusalem is a big deal. So they try to squelch it. And what happens is this. As a result, the 100,000 people flee. They, they, They leave. They run for their lives. So now what happens is this, all these people who have gotten together in homes, who have been in the temple temple worshiping together, all these people who have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, now persecution breaks out and they spread. And what happens when they spread is the message of Jesus now begins to be spread from Jerusalem to Judea, their country, Samaria, the least of these, and to the ends of the earth. Now I have observed through history that every time a great leader rose up to try to persecute a group of Christians, every time he tried to stamp them out, what tended to happen was he might kill a few people, but the word spreads. The message grows deeper. Lives are changed. And I think about that, then I think about our current culture. And we are possibly the most entitled generation in the course of human history. We are. We think that everything is for us. Like I've read some articles recently that talks about how people in their 20s right now are struggling in major debt because they feel entitled to have the same kinds of things that their parents have that they've worked their whole life to accrue. So people in their 20s buy cars that they can't afford and homes that they can't afford and they live at a level of financial expense that they can't afford to keep up with their parents who have worked their whole life to get to that level. There's some good things about a sense of entitlement. It causes us to work harder because we expect more. But a sense of entitlement also has the potential to rob us in our relationship with God. 
we feel entitled. We feel like as long as I got mine, as long as my salvation is secure, as long as I'm good with God, I'm fine. But I just want to submit this to you. If you live your life that way, it is entirely possible that you have missed the message of Jesus. If you live your life for you, you have missed the hope that he offers. It's for you and others. So my question to you is this. How do you view church? Well, what do you think of when you think of church? Like, let me ask you three questions. Number one, why do you feel like we gather together in Jesus' name? What is the purpose of all of this? Why sing? Why put on all this production? Why do all this work? Why set up and tear down? Why do all these things? So we want to be about the mission of Jesus. What happens when we gather? We come together, we worship together, we meet needs together through serving each other, through giving, through just giving of our time. We meet needs. We do this together, right? We're empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we can scatter. And I just want to say to you, if you're not living a life that is scattered, if you're not living a life that cares about other people where you witness, and the witness that Jesus talks about is just tell people what you've experienced. If your life has been changed by Jesus, tell somebody about it. Like, don't let a day go by and don't let another opportunity pass you by where you don't share your faith. And you may say, why is that, Jason? Because heaven and hell are realities. And people are going to spend eternity somewhere. And you never know. Like, you're not promised your next breath. You're not. And all those around you, your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, they're not promised their next breath. And so what are you going to do in these moments to share your message of hope, to share the message of faith, to invite people to experience the life change that Jesus offers because it matters? Here's the question I want to really wrestle with for just a moment that we're going to close. If we're not about that, I'm gone. Our church is not going to be about that. I'll find you another pastor who would love to come in here and just like keep the Christians happy. This morning on my way to church, I passed by 13 different churches I counted, 13 that I knew of, 13 churches. And they're great churches doing all kinds of great things, but the truth is so many churches have fallen into this trap because there's this gravitational pull towards keeping Christians happy, towards making sure that we do plenty of things to keep Christians calendar full so they don't have any time with people that are not Christians not our approach at all. And if we ever get to that place, I promise you, I'll submit my res- le- letter of resignation. I'll be gone because I'm going to be about this. So my question is this, will you join me? Will you begin to understand that we are called to gather together in Jesus' name for a purpose, to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit, but not so that we can stay here, not so that you can get your God fix and go home and feel like I got it all together now, I'm good but so that we can scatter and spread the message of hope to those around us. Let me get bold and get in your face for three seconds and say this to you. If you're here and there are people in your life that you know don't know God, they're far from God, and you haven't done anything about it, okay, the Bible would go as far to say as that their blood, the potential of their eternity is on your hands, okay? Now, we don't normally get that strong and we don't normally preach like that, but I hope you feel that. Like, I hope the weight of eternity rests on you tonight like a brick. I hope when you try to sleep that your heart will be flooded by the names of people around you who desperately need a relationship with God. And I hope when you bring them to church, I hope when you share your story of faith, when you see them enter into a relationship with God where they receive his forgiveness and they surrender to his lordship, I hope it clicks for you. I I hope you get it. I hope you understand there's a reason we do church like this. There's a reason we created a place like this, like Greg said on the video, where he could invite his family, where he could invite his friends, where he knew that they would hear a message of a God who so desperately loves them. There's a reason we do it this way. And here's why. Because we want to be about the thing Jesus is about. So here it is one more time. We put that, that illustration back up for me one more time, Jason. We are called to gather in his name. And I hope, I hope you get the value of this. I hope you never take for granted how much we need each other. You need to be okay with needing each other, and I need you, you need me, we need each other. But we're gathered together here to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, not so that we can just get a God fix and get goosebumps and feel like we've done our thing, but so that we can scatter. And so many churches are good at the first two. I'll be honest, they suck at the last one. And this is going to be the kind of church that doesn't ever lose its focus on the scattering part. If we're just going to gather 
man, I'd rather stay home and watch like football, like all the pregame. I'm going to be honest with you. There's a purpose to this thing. We are gathered to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit, to scatter, to do what Jesus said, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Lakeland, and in Brandon, Judea, our country, Samaria, those living around us who are so far from God and they feel reprehensible to you, to the ends of the earth. The Lord added to their number daily. What would happen if we partnered with God, realized that eternity is at stake. We gathered so that we could be empowered, so that we could scatter. I think that we might be a part of the beginning of a revival that we see happen that makes a difference, not just in Lakeland, not just in Brandon, but to the ends of the earth. Will you pray with me? God, this one is uh, way easier to talk about than it is to do. It is. Father, forgive us if we've ever bought into the lie that church is just about keeping Christians happy, that it's just about filling Christians' calendars with more stuff to do, that the church is just about making us feel good or helping us to feel like we've checked God off of our weekly to-do list. Forgive us for that, Father. God, for those of us who have bought into that lie, I'm asking you to open our eyes to the reality that we're a part of a mission to go everywhere we can to tell the world about you. So God, this week as we go, I pray for divine opportunities. I I pray for moments this week where we'll have the chance to just share life, to invite someone into a relationship with you, to be an encourager, to invite someone to church. God, I pray that we'll never rest that we'll never find peace about this until heaven is full and hell is empty. God, may we see people the way you see them, through your lens, that every person is loved unconditionally by you, and they are the perfect candidate to receive your grace, to receive your forgiveness. And help us to recall that at one point in our life, we were lost, we were separated from you, but you can never be so lost and so separated from God that his love won't chase you, track you down, find you, forgive you, redeem you, restore you. God, may this church never settle into the habits that so many do. May this place never be the kind of place where we put on a good show, we treat church like a movie theater but may it be the kind of place where your Holy Spirit enables us to change and to change the world. So God, we thank you for that. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, maybe you're here and you know right now before we leave that you're not in right standing with God. And before we go, you want to get that right. Like right here, right now, you want to get it right. And you want to pray to receive God's forgiveness. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and just say, Jason, include me in this prayer in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Several people have responded. Jason, this is me. I know I'm not in right standing with God, but right here, right now, I want to be. Several people responded. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you with your own heart and your own words to just pray this after me. Jesus, right here today, I surrender my life to you. I give all of me to you. I thank you that you forgive me of my sins. I thank you that you see me through the eyes of love. Jesus, you came and lived in this world and died for me. You rose again from the dead for me. And because of that gift that you gave me, which was your life, I can experience life in you. So Jesus, I surrender me to you now. I give all of me to you. From this day on, I'll live for you. I love you, Jesus. And I give you my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, we just had a lot of people respond. Can we celebrate that together, everybody? Yeah.